good day. Our lecture for PMCH would be on tuberculosis. This is based on a CPG 2016 which depends on harmonized evidence-based care. One of the goals in sustainable development goals would be to end tuberculosis by the year 2035. It aims for a world free of tuberculosis that would mean zero deaths, disease, suffering due to tuberculosis. And we have different milestones and targets for 2020, 25, 2030 until 2035 which aims in the reduction in TB deaths and reduction in TB incidence. Quick facts. For tuberculosis, 288 out of 100,000 incidents. It has a 417 over 100,000 prevalence and is 10 over 100,000 in mortality. For the Philippines, it has a high tuberculosis burden, high MBRTB burden, and high TB HIV burden. It says that it is the number six cause of morbidity and mortality in the Philippines. So 480,000 are MDR cases globally. Only 25% are detected and treated. 50% would be treated successfully. And as you know, treatment for tuberculosis is lengthy and difficult to tolerate. And this is a comprehensive Philippine Act of Action to Eliminate TB as a public program and appropriating fund, therefore, signed into law April 26 of 2016. So how do we diagnose, treat, prevent, and control tuberculosis among adult Filipinos? So recommendations would be prompt diagnosis, prompt treatment, look at drug-resistant tuberculosis, and look at vulnerable groups, and we aim for prevention and control. These are our WHO case definitions for tuberculosis. For adult, it's at least 15 years old and older. And we say the patient has presumptive TB when a patient with symptoms or signs are suggestive of TB, which this replaces the previous TB suspect or TB symptomatic. Bacteriologically confirmed case of TB would be a patient with a biological specimen positive by smear, microscopy, culture, or your WHO approved rapid diagnostic test or your expert. Clinically diagnosed is a patient who does not fulfill the criteria for bacteriologically confirmed TB but decided by a clinician for full treatment for TB. A case of pulmonary TB would be a case involving the lungs and tracheobronchial tree. Extrapulmonary TB would be a case involving the other lungs, such as the following. A patient with both pulmonary and extrapulmonary TB should be classified as a case of pulmonary tuberculosis. So how is a presumptive TTB patient identified. So it presents with at least two weeks duration of cough, 
Your cough is unexplained of any duration in a close contact. We have chest x-ray findings suggestive of PTV. And any of the following. Cough of any duration, significant unintentional weight loss, fever, hemoptysis, chest pains not relatable to costochondritis, easy fatigability, night sweats, shortness of breath, or difficulty of breathing. Exams performed to confirm PTV would be a smear mycoscopy sputum done five times at least because of sensitivity issues, culture, or your WHO approved rapid diagnostic test. How should sputum specimens be collected for direct sputum smear mycoscopy? Should be collected through spontaneous expectoration and requires at least one teaspoonful, that's approximately 5 to 10 ml for DSSM. How many sputum specimens should be collected and how is it timed? So, two sputum specimens should be obtained for DSSM. And a same day strategy using two consecutive specimens collected one hour apart is recommended for direct zeal Nielsen microscopy. If available, light emitting diode microscopy is the preferred diagnostic microscopy method for DSSM replacing your conventional Zeal Nielsen. A case of PTV is considered confirmed if at least one sputum smear is positive for acid fast bacilli. So this is how we interpret our smear results by Zeal Nielsen or Florence fluorescence microscopy. So, it's either 0 plus N, 1 plus, 2 plus, or 3 plus with the corresponding AFBC during microscopy. TB culture should be requested because it remains the gold standard for TB diagnosis. If available, sputum TB culture can be requested in the diagnostic workup of TB, especially if we are to rule non-tuberculous mycobacteria. However, drawback would be the long turnaround time of results, limiting accessibility and cost to its routine use. So, if it's culture positive for mycobacterium tuberculosis, case is bacteriologically confirmed PT. So, these are the TB culture facilities in Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. Now, would be, there would probably be an increase in TB culture labs because of the increase of biosafety labs because of the coronavirus now. So what are the indications for performing sputum TB culture with drug susceptibility testing? So retreatment of cases, if there is treatment failure, or there are known contacts of drug-resistant cases of the patient. It should not be routinely performed among new cases of PTV. When should expert be used and how accurate is it in confirming PTV? In the following clinical situations, it could be used as an initial diagnostic test 
for presumptive TD has a pool sensitivity of 89% and specificity of 99%. Or it could be used as a follow-on test to a smear negative positive chest x-ray findings with a sensitivity of 67% and specificity of 99%. As initial diagnostic test for presumptive drug-resistant TB, pool sensitivity of 95, specificity of 99% for rifampicin-resistant TB. To increase TB detection among culture-confirmed cases by 23% compared to direct sputum microscopy. And for smear-positive Culture positive TB expert pool sensitivity was 98%. For expert, these are the sputum specimen requirements. At least 1 ml of sputum specimens or 2 ml of fresh sputum for test and retest is needed for expert. If available, Bronchial washings may be alternate specimens for sputum. So the National TB Program has designated dot centers nationwide with capacity to process specimens for free expert for these following priority cases. Presumptive drug-resistant TB, presumptive HIV-associated TB, and follow-on test for smear negative with checks x-rays positive new presumptive TB. So this is how your expert uh, um, our MTBRIF test would look like. And it just has a 2-hour third hour. So how would you interpret expert TB results. So, if it reads the following, MTB detected, RIF detected, it means your MTB target is detected within sample. Your mutation in the RPOB gene has been detected and a full first and second line drug panel should be conducted. So if it's RMTB detected, RIF resistance not detected, MTB is detected, and your mutation has not been detected in the RPOB gene. It could be indeterminate. Your RPOB gene could not be determined due to insufficient signal detection, and MTB is not detected within the sample. So how would we interpret these following results? If positive, case is considered bacteriologically confirmed. So these are the expert facilities in Region 8. And there is a need for more sensitive diagnostics. So it would mean higher capacity for detecting positive cases. So what would, should be done for presumptive PTB who cannot expect to rate sputum? So sputum induction could be done. This is 15 to 20 minutes of nebulization with 15 ml of 2.5 to 5% hypertonic saline for individuals unable to expect the rate provided it is done by trained staff in facilities with caution for patients with history of asthma. This manual of procedures recognized where patients could be classified as sputum not done or unable to produce sputum. 
These are in patients who are mentally incapacitated as decided by a medical institution, debilitated or bedridden, or patients unable to produce sputum despite sputum induction. If it is smear negative, chest x-ray should be performed for all smear negative presumptive PTB. <coughs> if available, expert should be requested among smear negative presumptive TB cases with radiologic findings suggestive of PTB with no risk for drug resistant TB or HIV associated TB. So these are your procedures for diagnosis based on lab reports. So this is a summary slide of all the previous slides that I have presented. And this is an algorithm for decision making for TB diagnosis among smear negative presumptive TB adults. <coughs> what is the role of chest x-ray in the diagnosis of PTB? Although a good screening test to identify presumptive TB, a single film cannot accurately confirm active PTB by this modality alone. So no chest x-ray findings considered specific for active TB. So it must be clinically correlated together with your bacterial confirmation before initiation of appropriate treatment. A good quality chest x-ray film is needed to initially guide the clinicians in the identification of presumptive TB for further bacteriologic confirmation. The quality of the chest x-ray film cannot be overemphasized. A standard chest examination should be an erect PA and left lateral projection performed during full inspiration and should include both lung apices and costophrenic suicide. This remains unchanged since the 2006 recommendations. The role of chest CT scan in the diagnosis of PTB cannot be recommended unless other coexisting disease conditions are highly considered to explain patient's presentation or to evaluate possible complications or sequela of PTB. Clinical correlation and bacteriologic confirmation should still be done. Extrapulmonary tuberculosis recommended diagnostic workup would include direct microscopy, TB culture, and expert. Expert should be preferred over conventional microscopy and culture as initial diagnostic test for CSF specimens from presumptive TB meningitis. Expert may replace usual practice for testing lymph nodes and other selected tissues from presumptive extrapulmonary TB. The role of the following tests, TST cannot be used to diagnose active PTB, QFT, GIT, LISPAT, and IGRA are not recommended. MODS and LAM are not recommended to diagnose TB disease. These tests, furthermore, are not readily available in the country. In areas where they are available, they are mainly used for research purposes. So we go to TBHIV and other high-risk And diagnosis. So again, these are WHO case definitions. A new case 
is a case of TB that has never been treated or has taken TB drugs for less than one month. Retreatment case would be cases that received at least one, one month of TB drugs in the past with the following sub-classifications. Relapse is previously treated, now diagnosed with a recurrent episode of TB. Treatment after failure, a previously treated and recently declared treatment fail. Treatment after loss to follow up with interrupted treatment for two consecutive months. And previous treatment, outcome unknown, previously been treated for TB, but most recent treatment outcome is unknown or undocumented. For the pre-treatment evaluation that has to be done for patients with TB disease. So, thorough history and PE should, should be um, done on all patients with TB. Check for liver risk factors such as chronic alcohol consumption, viral hepatitis, pre-existing liver diseases, exposure to hepatotoxic agents, and prior abnormal ALT, AST, bilirubin, and HIV. Provide baseline visual accuracy. And these are the baseline labs that should routinely be requested before starting TB meds. You have your baseline ALT and creatinine. All TB patients with history of high-risk behavior for HIV and coming from areas with high HIV prevalence should be offered HIV testing. You screen for diabetes mellitus using FPS, RBS, or a 75 gram oral glucose tolerance test for all TB patients. Serum uric acid testing is not recommended prior to starting TB meds. So finding of asymptomatic hyperuricemia is not an indication to avoid pirazinamide. So these are the areas in the Philippines with high HIV prevalence. So what is the effective treatment for new TB cases? So if you are a category 1, which means you have no risk factors for drug resistance, regimen is 2-HRZE and 4-HR regardless of bacteriologic status. Effective treatment regimen for retreatment of TB cases, so this is your category 2 regimen, should only be given among confirmed rifampicin-sensitive retreatment cases or in circumstances where expert cannot be performed. Should be immediately referred to the nearest expert facility and RRTB cases should immediately be referred to a PMDT facility for further management. Your category regimen would be 2HRZES, 1HRZE, 5HRE. How should PTB patients who have interrupted treatment be managed? So these patients who fail to follow up as scheduled should be immediately traced through telephone call, text message, or home work link, workplace visit. So if it, it is less than one month, we could continue treatment. We just prolong your treatment regimen to compensate. Less, greater than one month, but less than two months, you test for your smears. If it's negative smear, you continue treatment and prolong to compensate. If it's positive, either less than or greater than five months. If it's less than, continue treatment, prolong to compensate. 
greater than five months, you already classify as treatment failed. More than two months, you classify as lost to follow up and repeat your smears. For miliary TB, in the absence of meningitis or both and joint development, effective treatment is using your category 1 treatment. Dissemination to your other organs are to be treated according to recommendations for treatment of extrapulmonary tuberculosis. So this is how we classify our TB. So category 1 is new pulmonary TB or miliary TB. 1A is new TB CNS bones joints involvement. Category B with B with treatment or IRF susceptible PTB and EPTB. And 2A would be RIF susceptible TB CNS bones or joints with the following treatment regimens recommended. So what are the roles of corticosteroids for the treatment of extra PTB? It is recommended as adjunct therapy only for patients with TB meningitis and TB pericarditis. Regimen of which would be dexamethasone, 0.4 mg per kilogram per 24 hours over 6 to 8 weeks. And in pericarditis, it is prednisolone, 60 mg for the first 4 weeks, 30 mg for weeks 5 to 8, 15 mg for weeks 9 to 10, and 5 mg for week 11. So you follow with the tapering doses, dosage of steroid administration. What's the role of surgery in the management of extra TB? So in your CNS, indications for neurosurgical referral for early VP shunting would be hydrocephalus, tuberculous cerebral abscess, vertebral tuberculosis with paraparesis. Spine, those who develop progressive kyphosis or have spinal cord compression. Pericardium, we open under general anesthesia for pericardial effusion. In the pleura, it may be needed pigtail drainage and get decortication in symptomatic patients due to pleural loculation and So how is it administered the treatment? So direct observed treatment should be offered to all patients who will undergo treatment. So these are provided in health centers in the DOTS programs and they could choose where to be treated and who will be the treatment partner. And it is shown that outcomes are better with patient-centered direct observed treatment in terms of completion of treatment, smear conversion, and default rates compared to daily health facility-based treatment and is less expensive in a program setting. How do we track patients and monitor adherence? Healthcare providers should educate the patient and treatment partner along with following strategies to track and monitor adherence to treatment. So remind patients of appointments through phone calls and texts. You have your default reminder letter for missed visits. You give incentives for enablers such as nutritious daily meals and food packages. And you coordinate with DOTS centers and support groups. So there are single drug formulations and these are convenient in terms of accept acceptability 
side effects and adherence and is preferred in the program setting which is similar to single drug formulations in preventing treatment failure or relapse when given under DOT. So these are useful for the following situations, adverse reactions or at risk for adverse reactions such as in elderly and those who have liver disease and those who have comorbid conditions requiring those adjustments. The effectivity is recommended particularly is used daily regimen. Intermittent regimens of less than three times a week is not preferred. And it is offered only in special situations where daily regimen is not feasible. So we monitor treatment response. Not recommended would be your rapid diagnostic test. Chest x-ray is also not a substitute for microbiological monitoring. So we monitor by doing our direct spear sputum microscopy during months 2, months 3, 5, and six and this would indicate if your treatment <coughs> is responding or not this is for category two so these are how we classify treatment outcomes you are cured when your bacteriologically confirmed tb was smear negative or culture negative in the last month of treatment and on at least one previous occasion in the continuation phase. Treatment completed is defined as treatment without evidence of failure but with no record to show that sputum smear or culture results in the last month of treatment and on at least one previous occasion were negative. Treatment fail, smear or culture positive at 5 months or later during treatment. Or clinically diagnosed patient without clinical improvement anytime during treatment. Patient could die, loss to follow up, interruption of 2 consecutive months or more, and not evaluated, no uh, treatment outcome is assigned including those transferred to another DOTS facility or outcome. A patient is considered non-infectious. At least 14 daily doses of treatment has been administered and there is already sputum conversion and there is clinical improvement. In clinically diagnosed, it's considered non-infectious at least 5 daily doses of treatment with evidence of clinical improvement. These are the common adverse reactions to anti-tuberculosis drugs. The minor adverse reactions are such. Major adverse reactions would be skin rash due to hypersensitivity. John, this due to hepatitis, impairment of visual acuity and color vision due to optic neuritis, hearing impairments, ringing of the ears, dizziness due to damage to the eighth cranial nerve, oliguria because of renal disorder, and psychosis and convulsion. Adverse drug reactions due to drugs should be monitored and managed by for minor adverse reactions first line drug should not be stopped without adequate justification but for major adverse reactions all drugs must be discontinued and you switch to a single drug formulation referred to a specialist is warranted 
For gastrointestinal reactions, if it is mild, you just reassure and continue your medication. If it's persistent, you prescribe antacids. And food intake not recommended as first-line management. Peripheral neurop neuropathy, so we monitor for burning or numbness or tingling sensation in the hands, feet. Laboratory tests are not needed, with the risk factors included as follows. Treatment would be vitamin B6, 50 to 100 milligrams OD, or you could prescribe vitamin B6, 10 milligrams once a day as profit. Visual impairment manifests as progressive painless blurring of vision, decreased color perception, loss of central vision, and optic atrophy. We test visual activity and color perception for individuals who develop signs and symptoms of ocular toxicity while undergoing TB treatment. Etambuto should be discontinued if visual impairment develops and a referral to an ophthalmologist is warranted. If it's an autotoxicity, patients on streptomycin should be advised to stop and referral to an ENT specialist is done for appropriate management. For hyperuricemia, parents on pyrazinamide should be monitored for symptoms of gouty arthritis. Serum uric acid should only be requested for patients who develop symptoms of gouty arthritis. If patient has gouty arthritis, discontinue your pyrazinamide, administer standard treatment for hyperuricemia, and refer to a rheumatologist if symptoms persist. For cutaneous reactions, if the rashes are minor, you give your antihistamines and you continue your TB treatment. If it is generalized and associated with fever and involvement of the mucous membranes, you stop all drugs immediately and refer to a specialist. When the cutaneous reaction improves, medications can be restarted at full dose or reintroduced one by one at intervals of three to seven days. <coughs> Routine monitoring of renal function is not needed if asymptomatic and without risk factors for nephrotoxicity. Request for serum BUN, creatinine, urinalysis, for patients who have signs and symptoms of nephrotoxicity such as oliguria and edema. For those who develop ne nephrotoxicity, discontinue streptomycin and refer to a nephrologist. Okay. So, drug-resistant TB is suspected when all retreatment cases, relapse treatment, failure treatment after loss to follow up are all drug resistant. Or new cases who are non converter of category 1, contacts of drug resistant TB cases, and persons living with HIV with signs and symptoms of TB. So you assess if the likelihood of drug resistance. So, DRTB is diagnosed through conventional drug susceptibility testing on culture isolates, genotypic DST, and expert as initial test in presumptive drug-resistant TB cases. So, all DRTB <coughs> referred to nearest DOTS facilities with drug monitoring services or to an expert facility. This should be managed under programmatic setting, so outside the proper framework would only lead to further drug resistance. 
immediate referral to the nearest PMDT treatment center or satellite treatment center is mandatory. Is there a role in surgery in management of your DRTB? So localized cavitary form should continuous MTB excretion after four months of DOT is recommended. It is an integral component of your MDRTB programs as long as surgical expertise and facilities are present. So we have the multidisciplinary approach. For people with HIV, all newly diagnosed people living with HIV should be screened for active to how is PTB diagnosed in HIV? So symptomatic screening could be done. Expert is done as an initial test in presumed HIV TB. Should be referred to the nearest DOTS facility. And if expert is negative, diagnosis for TTB will be based on a high index of clinical suspicion. So this is your algorithm for your HIV, PTB, extrapulmonary, and what should be used, whether expert, x-ray, or clinical symptoms. Treatment regimens is the same as the general populations. In addition to that, Cochimoxazole prophylaxis should also be given to prevent pneumocystis pneumonia among PLHIV regardless of CD4 count. What is the optimal time to start antiretroviral treatment? ART should be initiated after the second week of TB treatment regardless of CD4 count. For patients with TB meningitis, antiretroviral therapy should be initiated and after the intensive phase of TB treatment. Efavirenz is the preferred NNRTI for HIV patients on TB treatment. Avoid the use of nevirapin because of drug child interaction. Refer to PMDT treatment facilities immediately. Screening for TB people with in DM may be considered due to the high TB prevalence in Treatment regimen for TB among diabetics is the same as the general population. Ensure glucose control for diabetic individuals. So, in difficult to control diabetes mellitus, refer to a diabetic specialist to achieve optimal glucose. For TB with CKD, first join drugs with those medications are appropriate. CKD on second line drugs are adjusted based on renal function. The best time to administer TB medication among CKD patients for patients on hemodialysis, anti-TB medication should be administered immediately after hemodialysis session. For patients on peritoneal dialysis, may be administered regardless of TB schedule. For chronic liver disease patients, this is the recommended regimen. For decompensated liver cirrhosis, refer to specialized centers is warranted because of the possible use of second-line TB drugs. For pregnant and lactating, it's the same as the general population. Streptomycin, however, is contraindicated in pregnant and lactating women. Supplementation with pyridoxine 
10 to 25 milligrams per day to pregnant and lactating women is recommended to prevent peripheral neuropathy. Chest X-ray with abdominal shield, if indicated, is considered to be relatively safe during pregnancy. An informed consent is necessary and pregnancy should neither deter nor delay the diagnosis and management of tuberculosis. Who should be screened for LTBI? People living with HIV, solid organ transplant patients, RA patients on biologicals, patients on chronic dialysis, DM patients or smokers, pregnant patients or contacts, injection drug users or immunocompromised, and pregnant women with HIV. What is the recommended screening and treatment for LTBI among high-risk clinical groups? So, TST is the preferred screening test for LTBI in resource-limited setting like the Philippines. You initiate isoniazid 300 mg daily for 6 months under DOT. Pyridoxin 25 mg per day to prevent peripheral neuropathy. Annual LTBI screening using either TST or IGRA is recommended for all rheumatoid arthritis patients receiving biologic. How do we prevent pulmonary TB? So proper cough etiquette to help minimize transfusion. Cover one's mouth when coughing minimizes the spread of infectious aerosols, face masks, not face pierced respirator masks among presumptive or diagnostic PPD. No evidence of additional protection for two or more surgical face masks in layers. Filtering face piece respirator masks, not surgical masks among exposed healthcare workers during procedures with high risk of aerosolization, and regular fit testing to ensure proper use of filtering face piece respirator mask. How often should household contacts be screened? So they are incre at increased risk of infection and disease should be screened for disease activity at least by a chest x-ray, especially if the index case is bacteriologically confirmed, with coughs and has yet to receive treatment. Factors that increase the risk of contracting TB infection and promote progression would be smokers, alcoholics, underweight, compared to the general population. Risk for TB disease is significant among recent infection. And periodic monitoring for symptoms repeat chest x-ray 4 to 6 months to establish stability to detect TB disease early. Treatment of latent TB infection in the general population is not recommended. Isolation is recommended for bacterially confirmed PTB cases not started or in early stages of TB treatment, presumptive DRTB, or documented or presumptive. So, <coughs> for healthcare facilities, administrative control should be done. Surveillance of your TB exposures among healthcare workers and environmental control. We use PPE for healthcare workers at high risk. So, what infection control measures can be used? Very much similar to your coronavirus hand hygiene, use of PPE, filtering respirator face masks disinfection, 
disposal of infectious wastes. So you see, everything that we are teaching now with coronavirus is nothing new. It just so happened that coronavirus has an acute phase and kills and has a mortality rate higher in, relate, in relation to time compared to PTB. But you will see that PTB has more complications and is more prevalent than your coronavirus. Hence, it is important to practice these primary preventive measures to prevent tuberculosis as well on top of your coronavirus. Thank you for listening to this lecture. Subscribe to PMCHJFSM for more updates on your topics. Thank you.